Aztec Warfare The Aztecs engaged in warfare, Yeotl, to acquire territory, resources, quash rebellions, and to collect sacrificial victims to honor their gods. Warfare was a fundamental part of Aztec culture with all males expected to actively participate and battle, referred to in Nahuatl poetry as the Song of Shields, was regarded as a perpetual religious and political necessity. The Aztecs were so accomplished in combat that they eventually forged an empire which covered 200,000 square kilometers and, at the height of their power, they extracted tribute from 371 city-states across 38 provinces. The Aztecs believed that the god of the sun and war Huitzilopochtli had been fully armed and ready for war from the very moment of his birth from his mother Kotlikyu. Indeed, the first act of this bloodthirsty war god was to kill without mercy his rebellious sister Koyalzakwi and his 400 siblings, the Sensen Huitznawak and Sensan Mamiskoa. In mythology, the dismembered bodies of Koyalzakwi and the 400 became the moon and stars respectively. That warfare was an everyday reality is reflected in the Aztec belief that the conflict between Huitzilopochtli and his siblings reoccurred every day, symbolized by the contest between sun and moon every 24 hours. Further, that war was glorified is evidenced in the belief that fallen warriors accompanied the sun on their daily journey and later returned to earth as hummingbirds. Human sacrifices were regularly made to Huitzilopochtli at his temple atop the Great Pyramid, the Templo Mayor, at the Aztec capital Tenochtitlan. One of the most important sacrificial ceremonies was held on the winter solstice, the traditional beginning of the campaign season. The military commander-in-chief was the king himself, the Tilatoni. He was assisted by his second-in-command, who had the title Siwakotl. Joining these two in a war council were four more of the highest-ranking nobles, typically relatives of the king. These four had the titles of Tlacacocatl, Tlaxetacatl, Tilancalqui, and Etzuanhuanco. Reporting to the council were diverse units of warriors with varying levels of status, although it is important to note that brave and able soldiers could certainly climb through the ranks if they took a specific number of captives. Aztec symbols of rank included the right to wear certain feather headdresses, cloaks, and jewelry, lip, nose, and earplugs. Officers also wore large ensigns of reeds and feathers which towered above their shoulders. The most prestigious units were the Kuchik or Shaved Ones and the Otontin or Otomis. These two elite units could only be joined by warriors who had displayed no fewer than 20 acts of bravery in battle and were already members of the prestigious Jaguar and Eagle warrior groups. Even the lowest ranks could win through valor privileges, such as the right to eat in the royal palaces, have concubines, and drink pulque beer in public. Warriors were trained from a young age in special military compounds where children learned to master weapons and tactics and where they were regaled with tales of battle from veteran warriors. Youths also accompanied the Aztec army on campaign, acting as baggage handlers, and when they finally became warriors and took their first captive, they could at last cut off the piacli hair lock at the back of their necks which they had worn since the age of ten. Boys were now men and ready to fulfill their purpose, to die gloriously in battle and return as hummingbirds. The Aztecs did not have a permanent or standing army but called up warriors when required. Each town was required to provide a complement of 400 men for campaigns, during which they would remain as a unit led by one of their own senior warriors and march under their own standard but also be a part of a larger group of 8,000 men. As many as 25 such divisions, or 200,000 men, could be mobilized for a large-scale campaign. Besides men, towns also had to provide supplies such as maize, beans, and salt, which would be carried on campaign by the baggage handlers. 
On the march the army was preceded by scouts, easily recognized by their yellow face paint and conch shell trumpets, and priests, who bore images of Huitzilopochtli. The main body of the army, often stretching some 25 kilometers along narrow trails, had the elite units leading from the front. Next came ordinary units from each of the empire's allies, starting with the armies of Tenochtitlan, and finally, the troops acquired from tribute quotas brought up the rear. When necessary, camps were simple affairs with reed mat shelters for the elite and the open air for ordinary troops. Aztec warriors were taught from childhood in weapons handling and they became expert users of clubs, bows, spears, and darts. Protection from the enemy was provided via round shields, chamali, and, more rarely, helmets. Body armor, Ichkahuapili, was also worn and made from quilted cotton which was soaked in salt water to make the garment stiffer and more resistant to enemy blows. Clubs or swords, Macuahuitl, were studded with fragile but super sharp obsidian blades. Spears were short and used for jabbing and stabbing the enemy at close quarters. The Otlatl was a dart throwing device made of wood, and using one, an experienced warrior could direct accurate and deadly darts, middle, or javelins, placocli, while remaining a safe distance from the enemy or during the first stage of battle when the two armies lined up facing each other. Shields of wood or reeds were made more resistant with leather additions and decorated with heraldic designs such as birds, geometric shapes, and butterflies. Elite warriors could wear leather helmets, elaborately carved with symbols of their rank and unit. There was no uniform as such, but ordinary warriors wore a simple tunic over a loincloth and wore war paints. Elite warriors were much more impressively decked out with exotic feathers and animal skins. The jaguar warriors wore jaguar skins and helmets with fangs, whilst the eagle warriors were dressed for battle in feathered suits complete with talons and a beaked helmet. Usually campaigns began in order to redress a wrong such as the murder of traitors, the refusal to give tribute, or failure to send representatives to important ceremonies at Tenochtitlan. The Aztecs also sought to create a buffer zone between their empire and neighboring states. These areas were treated slightly better, allowed greater autonomy, and were obliged to give less tribute. Yet another reason for war was the Coronation Wars. These were traditional campaigns whereby a new Aztec Tilatoni proved his worth following his accession by conquering regions and acquiring tribute and prisoners for sacrifice. Actual fighting was usually preceded by diplomatic missions where ambassadors, Quaquinoxen, reminded of the price of defeat in battle and attempted to persuade a peaceful alternative of reasonable tribute and acceptance of the supremacy of the Aztec gods. Additionally, spies, Quimictin or Hamais, could be sent into the target area disguised as merchants and dressed in local costume. If, upon the failure of diplomacy, war was still necessary and the defending army was defeated, then the principal city was sacked and the whole region considered conquered. On the battlefield, usually a plain, combat was typically preceded by both armies facing each other with much shouting, posturing, and the beating of drums and blowing of conch shell trumpets and bone flutes. Leaders positioned troops to best take advantage of local geographical features, and they led from the front and very much by example, throwing themselves into the battle. As the two armies faced off, heavy stones were thrown and followed by a more deadly volley of darts. Then came a bloody hand-to-hand -hand combat, where the obsidian-bladed spears and clubs slashed the enemy, creating fearsome wounds. Here all order was lost and battle became a series of independent duels where warriors tried to capture their opponent alive. Indeed, Assistance with ropes followed the fighting in order to immediately truss up the vanquished for later sacrifice. Ruse tactics could also be employed, 
such as pretending to flee the battlefield or hiding in cover trenches in order to ambush enemy troops. Victory conventionally came when the enemy's main temple had been sacked. The discipline and sheer ferocity of the Aztec warriors was usually far superior to that of the enemy and ensured success after success across ancient Mexico.